A few years ago, I was in a small shop in the mountains of Colorado searching for maps, and I came across this gorgeous map of the U.S. It's from the late 1700s, made by a French cartographer, and it was designed to lay out New France. Now that alone is already really interesting, but the thing that stood out to me and made me want to buy this map was in the upper left corner, near where we have Oregon, Washington, instead what it had written was Parts Unknown. I had never seen a map like that before. Now I know there are plenty of maps, especially of the New World maps, where the west coast isn't filled in, but it was those words specifically, parts unknown, that stood out to me. Today we have Google Maps, Apple Maps, Rest in Peace MapQuest. I think they're gone? <laughs> there are no more blank spaces. All the corners of the map has been filled in. Except for the ocean. I know the ocean's a different thing. But there's this amazing old phrase by the Polish-American scientist Alfred Korzybski that says, the map is not the territory. And what he means by that is that a map cannot fully one-to-one -one represent accurately the land that it describes. There's always this disconnect between the map and the land it represents. I have always loved maps. I've loved the current modern cartography and atlases, and also fantasy maps that come with novels and video games and fictional worlds. There's an amazing duality between the two that I wanted to explore today. So what is a map and why is it so important? When most people think of maps, Google Maps, Apple Maps, it's just the tool we use to get from A to B on any given day. But as good as they are, even Google Maps can't fully represent one-to-one -one the Earth, although it's getting pretty close with Street View and 3D models in the actual map itself. But the thing the map can't do is give you the experience of traveling through it. And I think fantasy maps and certain historical maps embrace this through a more artistic interpretation. There's this 16th century Dutch sea chart that was used during the spice trade, and it's just a beautiful example of where a map's utility meets artistic abstraction. Or this 16th century map of the French Roman city of Aurelia, named after the Roman Emperor Aurelian. Later, its name became Orléans, which shares some resemblance to its New World counterpart, La Nouvelle Orléans. Here we have an old map. Uh, it, it's an early map, I guess, of the city of New Orleans. And I just love how it's laid out. Almost a cross between a fortress city and a crown, with the cross as like the crown jewel of the crown there, where the Basilica of St. Louis is located. In the decades that followed this map's creation, the city would expand to include the surrounding swamplands, and the original part of the city is now known as the French Quarter, but the city's rich history is still preserved in these wonderful old maps, and I just love it. Fictional and fantasy maps have a little more artistic flair to them, since they don't need to be used in real life by merchants, sailors, and armies, but they still have a great deal of utility. The best place to start off is probably the most famous example of a fictional fantasy map, the Lord of the Rings Middle-Earth map. Now, Tolkien wasn't the first author to use a map in a fantasy novel. He drew inspiration from Gulliver's Travels and the Sundering Flood, but he definitely set the new standard. After Lord of the Rings came out, essentially every fantasy novel was expected to have a map, world atlas, to show cities, nations, settlements, mountains, and so we could better follow the character's journey throughout the books. What's wonderful is looking at the map from the Sundering Flood, you can feel its influence in Tolkien's world. The hills aren't just some lifeless point on a map. They have texture, they have character. The way they roll off into the distance, and the way the rivers wind behind the hills, it creates a sense of mystery that invites the reader to feel inspired to go beyond the map and explore the outer edges of the world. It's a wonderful tool to feel immersed in these stories. And what's so interesting is Tolkien had developed the maps and layout of this world, along with the languages, before he even had the plot for Lord of the Rings. It was almost like the story was birthed out of the land and history and culture and texture that was laid down as the foundation. And it works. I mean, look at today's some of the most amazing successful franchises. The Wheel of Time, uh, Song of Ice and Fire. They have incredibly detailed maps, and even the intro to the Game of Thrones TV show continually showed the maps, showed us where the major cities were, and reminded us of the places, the geography, the looming threats, the environments, the major houses and families and where they resided. Or take this map of the Northern Kingdoms from the Witcher series. I mean, this is just gorgeous. This is the kind of map that you hang on your wall. Here, the conflict between kingdoms is subtle, but still very present. 
And then we have this Witcher 3 map. It's laid out a bit differently, essentially just showing the places you'd visit in the game. Again, not showing the landscape and places to scale, but rather how they feel to travel through. You can almost imagine this as a sort of chessboard with the pieces laid out as the battle's about to take place. And just to be a little nostalgic, I think one of my all-time favorites is the Hyrule World Atlas from Ocarina of Time. This is about 25 years old at this point, but still gives me such joy to look at. Not only did you uncover each portion of the map as you explored it, but it's so richly illustrated and honestly not that far off from the real scale. Sure, there are portions that maybe have blank areas, but the blank areas could very well be full of life and secrets. These maps have a wonderful way of making me want to explore each part of it. I've had this book for a long time. Uh, it's the second edition of the Colorado 14ers, the highest peaks in the lower 48. And even looking at the map to the summit of Mount Harvard, the first 14er I hiked, it lays out this wonderful journey from the trailhead to the summit and all the things you'd see. Traveling up through Horn Fork Basin and passing Bear Lake on the way to the summit, these were wonderful things to experience. And looking at the map before the journey and while we were on the journey was really an amazing part of the experience. Now you might be thinking, okay, great. Middle Earth and the fantasy maps look awesome. Google Maps is less sexy but functional. How do the two relate and why do fantasy maps have to do with human history and culture. We can look back and see throughout the history of map creation, there's this embellishment, this imbuing of emotion woven throughout. Like this gorgeous map of the world centered around the Middle East, specifically Israel, as the center of the world, and then the continents of Europe and Africa and Asia, forming this cloverleaf around what the author considered as the center of the world. This was the first map of Middle Earth I drew, I think, when I was 14. It's clearly based off the map that came in the novel. Not only did the novel, but the map inspire me to want to make my own fantasy world. I think I'm probably the only person in the world, though, that felt that way. I don't think anyone else wanted to make their own fantasy world from Lord of the Rings. Shortly after that, I, uh, I, I did try to make my own uh, fantasy world, uh, starting with the map. So, since there was a Middle Earth, uh, I had the great idea of making a, a, a Western uh, Earth. It had all the classic trappings of towers and mountains and mines. And What strikes me looking at these maps again, the map of Middle Earth mainly, is just how much they add to the experience of reading the novels. You get to see how far the journey is that Frodo and the company have to travel from the Shire to Mordor. Obviously, it's described extremely well in the book how far they travel, but seeing it laid out on the map just made me able to make more sense of it. I mean, there's a really good reason why essentially any fantasy property that comes out now is expected to have a map. It helps ground you in the world, immerse you in the story, and make you feel like you're part of the culture and history of this fictional place. Looking at this map of Hyrule from The Legend of Zelda on my wall here, I think it's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. It's not representative, I think, of one specific game. Instead, it seems like it's more of a collectivized mythology of Hyrule. You see bits from Breath of the Wild, Ocarina of Time, Twilight Princess, Skyward Sword. Things aren't necessarily to scale. It's probably omitting some details that Google Maps would put in. It's more about the emotion of exploring the landscape, of how high this mountain feels to climb, the dragon that lurked on top, the ferocity of the sea monster just off the coast, how grand Hyrule Castle is to behold, and just how wonderful Hyrule is to be in. One thing that I think is easy to forget when we consume popular media, specifically Lord of the Rings popular media, is that the land itself was meant to be magical and not fully understood. The way the map's laid out isn't necessarily to show every single point of interest, but rather to give guideposts and leave open spaces where things aren't fully discovered. And you might encounter some monster or treasure or both sort of looming in the, in the shadows or the trees. Thinking of the land itself to be magical is again one of the most wonderful things I can think about a map trying to represent. Ultimately though, maps tell us stories, don't they? They connect us to the land. 
They tell us about heroes that did great deeds or wondrous events that transpired in faraway lands. Maps help remind us of the adventures that our ancestors went on, that we might share in as well if only we had the courage to embark, to see what's beyond the mountain, what's down the river. These stories and tales that maps hold are in a way a vital part of preserving the history and myth that bind us together, giving us a sense of who, what we are, where we come from, and what we might become if we set out and explored the map.